Welcome to the 6-8 Culture Podcast, an international community where we share stories of transformation and restoration from the inside out, based on justice, kindness, and humility. Come journey with us. I'm your host, Rob McKinley. Life is both uncertain and finite here on this earth. We don't know what tomorrow brings, but we have and hold the power of today. As we live our lives with intention and the pursuit of a better tomorrow for all, our paths are often crossed with people of common purpose. Today's guest is one such person. He has a diverse yet focused background in advocating for the oppressed, voiceless, exploited, and forgotten. He established the first international partner organization of International Justice Mission, bringing IJM to Canada in 2001. He worked on the Advisory Council of World Vision China and later as the VP of Programs and Policy and Vision Partners for World Vision Canada. He served as board chair for Vision Fund of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, CEO for Mercy Ships Canada, and is now the Executive Director of Partner Relations for Compassion Canada. He holds a master's degree in international human rights law from Oxford University. And I would summarize a human degree in justice, kindness, and humility. Jamie McIntosh, welcome to the 6-8 Culture Podcast. Thanks, Rob. It's really a treat to be with you, man. Well, thanks for joining us, Jamie. It's a treat to have you as well. So let's get right into this. How did your journey begin? Maybe you can just share a little bit on who you are, where you're from, and what makes you tick. I'd say it's always pretty difficult to um, explain oneself, try and interpret oneself and your motives and how you got wrapped up in things. But if I piece together some of the elements that sort of led me into where I find myself, the story probably begins with my parents' story or their own journey. And one place to start would be with my mom's. You know, she grew up in an immigrant family in rural southern Ontario. They were desperately poor. There would have been 21 or 22 children had all of my grandmother's pregnancies come to term. Wow. There were 13 children who lived past the age of four. They lived on the wrong side of the tracks, slept four to a bed were often in and out of care, foster care. My grandfather was a wonderful man as I recall him and encountered him, but uh, when he hit the bottle, he was a pretty mean alcoholic. Being as poor as they were, my grandmother used to teach my mom and her siblings how to tuck goods from the little department store in their small little town uh, under their dresses, under their clothing, to be able to have enough provisions to kind of last through the winter. As young as four years old, my mom was involved in stealing to help the family wow. survive. Mm -hmm. When she was a teenager, she remembers just feeling really convicted about what she had been involved with when she was a little kid, stealing from this couple that we affectionately have referred to as Grandma and Grandpa Chicas. They were the ones running that general store. They knew that my mom's family was really poor. They took them to church as often as they were willing to go. And of course, in that day, you had to show up in your Sunday best, which was non-existent in my mom's household. And not being people of great means themselves, but being very, very thoughtful and generous. They provide shoes, dresses, maybe some of the same sorts of things that were being stolen from them. My mom and her sisters, so they could go to church. My grandfather would sometimes wave them off with a loaded shotgun and uh, <laughs> go up the next week, just a little farther down the lane, uh, maybe outside of buckshot range, proceeded just to share God's love with them. So my mom went back to Grandma Chicas and said, Grandma Chicas, I just need to tell you, while you were being so kind to us, so generous with us, taking us to church, we were stealing from you. I was stealing from you the whole time. And Grandma Chicas just sort of looked at her with a little twinkle in her eye and smiled and said, well, that's okay, sweetie. We knew that all along. Wow. <laughs> and she said, Jesus just told us to love you. Mm. 
And so for me, I guess they say geography is destiny. You know, you roll the DNA dice again. Why was I born where I was born to a loving family that has looked after us and worked hard to try and provide for us and had enough means that that could set us up, me and my brother up to have a decent journey because I've traveled around the world and seen people who have been born into other circumstances where it's not about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, as they say, if you don't have boots or straps, how do you do that? I see someone caught up in adverse circumstance, but that could very easily be me. And no doubt if they were in a situation to give me a hand out of whatever I'm wrapped up in, they would if I'm in a position to come alongside or advocate for them with whatever I might have to do so. Then not only is that a responsibility, it really is a privilege and a joy. And it draws out the fullness, I think, of our humanity, knowing that no man is an island, as it were. No man or woman. We all are interconnected. And I think God put us on this spinning soil to help each other out. You know, sort of that Lean On Me song, because yeah. there'll be a time when I need someone to lean on. We just need to help each other through. And in times like these, I think it's just a joy to be able to stand with one another, spur one another on to love and good deeds. Mm -hmm. I think so many people can resonate exactly with what you're saying as you were describing that upbringing and your grandmother and that incredible act of grace from that couple. It was reminiscent of Les Miserables, the whole storyline behind that. Right? Yeah, it is. And it's kind of the drama that someone like uh, Victor Hugo pens. The reason it resonates is, yeah, it really traces the genuine goodness and compassion and mercy and acts of grace that are out there. Surprising acts like that I don't know, the bishop or whomever it was that had the silverware stolen right. and was like, well, just wait, you forgot the candlesticks, right? That's right, and, exactly. You know, it's just like, what? And that's what I love about the grace of the gospel is that God doesn't treat me as I deserve or I'd be really in trouble. He just delights to continue to pour out his goodness and his love and his mercy and his grace and then just beckons us to do the same and then is patient to work with us and on us so that we somehow some days get with the program and actually shed a little more light and brightness than uh, throwing the shade that we would be more inclined to do right our, if left our own devices right yep so true so true so how did you come about getting a master's in international human rights law from oxford was there something that triggered you to say, you know, this is a path that I want to go down? Yeah, it was actually sort of backwards, right? I found myself involved in situations where I had no business being. I think I was like 28, maybe when I had the opportunity to start International Justice Mission Canada. And the first question to ask me was, are you a lawyer? And I'd be like, uh, no. Uh, oh, are you an investigator? Like law enforcement? Is that your background? Is that how you got involved in this justice thing? I'd be like, uh, straight to, no, no, I'm, uh, I'm the least qualified person for this role. I didn't have a golden Rolodex of business contacts. I'm a recovering youth pastor, but had a passion for the little guy, <laughs> the person being ripped off, the, the underdog. I think maybe part of it was I was always a scrawny little guy when I was playing high school football. I was like, you know, five foot nothing, hundred and nothing, a fair bit bigger now. But when I started, I was one of the smallest tykes in my entire high school. But I just love to go out there and put it all out there and try and take guys who are twice my size and, mm. and take them down. And, you know, because it was a fun thing to be that little dog in the fight. Well, I um, was working with Compassion for about four years and traveling to places like Haiti and Guatemala and saw the good work that our partners were doing on the ground in standing with those who were dealing with extreme poverty and helping children get access to an education, the means to survive and, and thrive. But we would drive in different places where I would see children on the streets and I knew that there were corrupt police officers and others who were taking advantage of exploiting these kids. I knew there were rest of X in, in Haiti who were basically being trafficked for their labor, other times, sadly, for to be sexually exploited. And it just enraged me that kids were being mistreated en masse in this way all over the world. And in North America, in Canada, at least my experience would be that the police were there to protect those who were vulnerable. 
That may not always be the case and that may not be the experience that we've seen for everyone depending on who's involved and one's background, race, etc. The stories vary even here. But around the world, oftentimes I was learning that the poor often run from the police because the police were often those who would take most advantage of them because they were possessed of a bit more power yeah. and uh, could get away with it. So I wanted to do something about it. Long story, but ultimately was invited to join an organization in Washington, D.C. to help get really churches involved in the fight for justice for the vulnerable poor. One thing led to another, and instead of doing that, I pitched the idea of engaging Canadians in the work and was given the opportunity to launch it here. So then I found myself doing things like briefing members of parliament on human trafficking, on child labor, speaking to groups of law enforcement. You know, I remember speaking to hundreds of police from around the world, really at the Toronto Police Services International Sex Crimes Investigator Conferences. And because our investigators had cracked some cases overseas that uh, led to the apprehension of Canadians who were involved in exploiting children. And so we had this platform, but I had no credentials. And I felt like at some point I'm going to be briefing Superior Court judges <laughs> and someone's going to say, what right do you have to be in front of right. us? Show us your credentials. And so I had the opportunity with some financial assistance from a, a wonderful foundation that took a leap on backing me. And my board said, let's get after it. So yeah, spent a couple of years working on this master's in international human rights law. By the grace of God, got in. Even bigger grace, actually managed to uh, walk out of there with a degree. <laughs> so. <laughs> We're listening to Stories and Insights from Canadian Humanitarian and Executive Director of Partner Relations at Compassion Canada, J.B. McIntosh. Touching on that, a number of years ago, I read The Locust Effect by Gary Hogan, who founded International mm -hmm. Justice Mission in the U.S. So he was also the yeah. director of the U.N. investigation in the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide. And when I was reading That's this right. book, it just shook me to the core in my own understanding of the interplay of violence and poverty, when people are living outside the protection of the law, justice systems in global South countries only exacerbate poverty, they don't alleviate it. So you touch on Haiti there. Can you share maybe another example of somewhere where you've seen systemic corruption within the legal system in any particular country or situation that you've seen, and then maybe a redemptive story behind that? Yeah, um, so many places that one could point to in various community contexts around the world. It just so happens to be more pervasive in lower resource settings, I think, because mm. there's less checks and balances, uh, yeah. maybe less power to be able to expose injustice when it's happening so it can become more deeply entrenched. South or Southeast Asia, I've been in places where I've seen little kids being trafficked for sex, I've seen senior citizens being held into their 90th year working crushing rocks to try and extinguish a debt that their grandparents had incurred in the 1930s. And they had worked and paid off the principal dozens of times over, but because they were illiterate or innumerate, were held perpetually in this form of modern day slavery. In the early days, for example, in India, this form of illegal debt bondage had been outlawed since 1976 under international human rights conventions, obviously far before that. But a law that's on paper, a law that's enacted in a legislature means nothing if it's not enforced for the poor, for the victim. It was through working with people of goodwill, law enforcement, prosecutors, in those local contexts where we would be able to identify a few people of goodwill to say, hey, look, we have received referrals, we've received credible reports, we've got evidence of situations that are breaking your own national laws and that are depriving your citizens of their life, their liberty, the fruit of their love and labor. And we would love to walk alongside to do whatever we could to help ensure that they get their freedom, they get justice, but we have to do this together. I was in one particular case in 2003, 
in South Asia, where um, we worked on an inquiry, taking information to a local magistrate who had the power to conduct an inquiry into bonded labor slavery in a rock quarry that that day led to the release of 54 men, women and children, uh, 38 of them receiving these release certificates wow. and entitlement to sort of a rehabilitation package to start their life afresh. These were men, women, and children. One woman who was eight months pregnant, her job was to crush rocks 12 hours a day, seven days a week. They woke up that morning as slaves, and that night they were on a train bound for their home state with this release certificate in hand saying what was done to you was wrong, unjust, illegal, and it won't happen again. And over time, we've seen the authorities begin to take the cases through the court systems to actually hold the offenders, the slavers, accountable to the point where they started to do a day, two days, three months, six months, a year, two years, five years in prison for their crimes against these individuals. Mm. Same thing in Southeast Asia, seeing these children. I mean, I remember at times I would accompany our investigators into some of these places where children were being exploited and held against their will. And Westerners would come and pay small bits of money to violate these children. To see these trembling little kids and how vulnerable they were. But then to see when law enforcement would take action and rescue these children, set them free, place them in loving, caring homes with professionals who would walk through and help restore these children, these teenagers. And then to see some of these young women begin to start their own bake shops and begin doing pastry that would be, the cakes were so extravagant, they would be in demand by the royal family in some mm. of these places. Mm. And to see the dignity and spark come back on in the eyes of these kids and watch them then in turn often provide evidence where others were being held to go help set them free. It just rekindles your faith in humanity and says justice systems work if there is the political will to work them. And if Canadians, Americans, Brits, Germans, Aussies are complicit in the exploitation of the vulnerable poor, we need to stand together with those who are being victimized wherever they are in the world and walk together to try and bring about solutions and restoration wherever possible. Yeah, that restoration piece is so important as part of the impetus of keeping the ball rolling and moving on having systemic change. And systemic change is so important when it comes to justice initiatives and eliminating violence, which also in turn eliminates eliminates poverty. I was down in Bolivia back in 2017, and we actually did a bit of a joint venture with IJM when I was down there. And it really came to the forefront to me on that trip, the systemic challenges that were there when it comes to legalities in Bolivia, because they're founded under a different legal system than we are here in Canada. So a judge had come down, he was trying to teach some different ways of prosecution methods and having a dialogue with judges and lawyers down there in Bolivia. So there's a stat that I pulled up that shows for a country of 10 million people, the criminal justice system convicted fewer than three perpetrators of child sexual assault per year. During the time that I was there, there were just some ghastly stories of prosecutorial methods when it came to abuse and evidence. For instance, you can maybe corroborate this. The perpetrator would have 30 minutes for a time in court. And when that 30 minutes ran out, then it would be stayed until the next hearing, which could be another six months. And the victim and the perpetrator often would have to go to the crime scene together and the victim would have to testify while the perpetrator's there. So really, a system that continues to victimize the victim over and over and over again. But there are judges and lawyers there that are really eager for reformation. They're pleading for it and inroads are being made. Do you have any comment on any of that or some of the changes that you've seen there? Um, yeah, specifically with regard to Bolivia and the justice system, it was actually the first place that we at IJM Canada decided to resource the establishment of an operational field presence there between 2006 and 2008, kind of getting that set up. And what was happening at the time was fairly rampant abuse of street children, abuse of street children with impunity. 
the time we had uh, surveillance footage of corrupt law enforcement who would shake children down, kids who would shine shoes by day and then try to go to school by night. I'd spoken with some of these children in similar contexts down there in Bolivia who would shine shoes, make a dollar or two during the day in La Paz, and then they would catch the bus up to El Alto, where they lived, to go to night school. Sometimes caught on the way, they told me stories of the police would shake them down. They would either try to press them to break into homes to steal some goods and give those to the police, or be threatened that they would be charged for another crime that had taken place. And who are you going to believe? A child working on the streets or someone who has a badge. But the great thing was that the Bolivian National Police recognized that there was a problem. And they committed to working together to find solutions. And in the early days, we were training hundreds and upwards of thousands of police in the appropriate treatment of street children. And when I went back a few years later and met with some other street kids, asked them about the interactions between them and police, and they didn't really know why I was inquiring, they said, no, no, no. They're our friends. They get to know us by name. They encourage us to stay in school and they basically were treating them with dignity. To see that transformation take place because there were police officers who began to see what it felt like to defend children and to protect them and to advocate for them. It seems like they got more joy out of treating these children with dignity and seeing them start to flourish than to fall in with those who might use these kids as target practice, which was happening. We had credible reports of that happening in the Altiplano region back in the day. I think that learning from one another and sharing about developments in different justice systems doesn't have to be a one-way sort of, hey, we've got all the answers, we've got this all figured out, but learning together what works. You do see great strides where you've got judges from different country contexts sharing about the jurisprudence in their own countries, and, and it can enrich the dialogue and enrich the approaches, whether back in Canada or you know in Latin America or elsewhere around the world. If we can move over across the Pacific to the Philippines, they've been in the news for quite a few years now with the ongoing issue of cyber sex trafficking. For people that aren't familiar with this, it's usually a live stream of sexual abuse involving minors in exchange for money. Do you have any comment or experience in combating this, how great an issue it is, and maybe some victories? Really, the work that International Justice Mission was doing to combat that really ramped up after I had shifted to a different organization. So certainly we were aware of it taking place and there were some intersecting pieces, but it wasn't a type of casework that we had been involved with during my time. I don't think I could give a lot of specific information about how they were taking that on, but it's just stunning the things that people do to the vulnerable. I'm just grateful that there are organizations who are willing to step in, that there are law enforcement officers who are willing to step in to put a stop to horrendous abuse of children. That's very well said. Today, there are more than 40 million people confined to slavery. Human trafficking generates $150 billion annually and one in four victims of forced labor slavery is a child. But there's much hope and huge inroads are being made. Let's continue hearing more from justice advocate, Jamie McIntosh. Jamie, you've traveled to many countries, many that the average person will never get to or maybe would never elect to choose to go to. What are some of your favorite countries and cultures that you've experienced? I like asking somebody what's their favorite child or for me, you know, maybe their favorite flavor of ice cream, which can we not say all of them? I've tended to enjoy pretty much every place that I've gone, learning from the culture, getting to understand a little bit about the history, understand some of the struggles, see the faces of courage, you know, because most often it's the mother who steps up and fends for her children to ensure that they have a fighting chance, that they're not mistreated, but they are given the respect that their dignity really ought to entitle them to. 
whether they have the stature in the society, where that would be natural or expected. It's just incredible to watch people with great courage meeting fathers who have scooped up their kids in the middle of the night, go across militant lines to try and find their way to the city where they could get some food, shelter, and some clean water in the midst of a famine exacerbated by the war-torn strife in the region. It's also getting the opportunity to watch grandparents in China who are raising their grandchildren because the parents are off in the city trying to earn enough to provide for the next generation. And to see the grandparents loving their children, maybe not knowing how to bridge the generational gap of technology as they maybe worked as farmers themselves. And now the children in some of the programs that we have worked with at World Vision helping kids get an education. The kids are really proficient on the computers and the grandparents don't necessarily know how to relate, but they just are doing their best to love on these kids and to fend for them and to fight for them, to advocate for them. In Vietnam, seeing parents come together through kind of parent-teacher associations and not only advocate for children to get the best they can scholastically, but also socially and to work together to figure out ways of providing the best experience for them in the local community context. To places in, you know, Kenya, for example, seeing parents band together with children and teenagers who begin to press for more just policies and more equitable access to education or even simple things like having electricity or water points brought into their community so that the kids don't have to leave to go to the major city to make a livelihood for themselves. You know, so it's been pretty cool to just experience that level of care and concern that are just common around the world where parents are doing their best to uplift their children and fight for them and work so they can have a better day. Uh, Sorry, the other thing, Rob, is just the laughter. I mean, I'm often in places, sometimes for me, I'm there for a few weeks at a time or a few days at a time or just going from one project to another. And so oftentimes, you know, you're being shown a highlight reel of progress. Here's what's happened. Or the early stages of, you know, devastation, whether it's from a natural disaster or from an inhumane policy or conflict, or, you know, I've walked through the killing fields and understood you see the worst of man's inhumanity to man or to woman, but I've had the opportunity to just dance and laugh and run and catch goats with little kids who were on that rock quarry in India where there was this judicial investigation going on but the kids didn't really know what was going on and there were goats walking through the place and the kids wanted to pet the goats and so you know i was able to kind of corral one of them which was pretty comical and the kids laughing at me as i probably fell on my butt about six times and then watching the kids pet the goat and seeing little anandia a girl who would get her freedom that night grab her little brother's hand and teach him to pet the goat reminds me of emmanuela the older sibling of emmanuel lee a girl that my wife and I were able to sponsor some 20 years ago when we were in Haiti. We met this lovely family and my wife had a pair of sunglasses. All the kids were like, t'es lunette, t'es lunette. They all wanted to try on the sunglasses. And I remember watching Emanuela, the older sibling. You could see that she wanted to put the sunglasses on, but she wanted more for her little sister, like her three, four-year-old sister to be able to put these sunglasses on. So she guided them onto her little sister's face and then the faces and the grimaces and silly tongue sticking out and laughter that ensued. That's one of the coolest things is watching siblings care for their younger siblings. Yeah in ways that are so self-sacrificing. You know, another situation, we saw a little boy who was evidently walking with a pretty severe limp and his shoes were totally worn through, holes right through them. We were able to give him a pair of shoes, but all these kids were around. There were about 20 kids around. And we thought, oh no, this is the only pair of shoes that we have. This wasn't part of our program. It was just as we were going from one project to another, we saw this boy and happened to have an extra pair of shoes along. And I thought, oh no, we're going to create a riot. All the kids are going to want a pair of shoes and they all deserve one, but we only have one. What do we do? They did all run around this boy. And I thought, uh oh, this was early days. I didn't know really what I was doing. 
they ran around and they started clapping that boy on the back. They started cheering for him. They lifted his hands up. It was like Rocky had just, you know, (laughs) beaten Dragos and they were cheering for him and they were all thanking us for, you know, providing something for their friend. That was all that we were able to do at that point. That sense of community and camaraderie and uh, just celebrating someone else. It was pretty inspiring to us. Because I know my brother and I were uh, playing, I don't know, Atari when I was a kid. We'd be mm-hmm. fighting over the remote, right. the remote control, the joystick That's to be right. able to play. You know, it's it's uh, not quite the same way. So there are things that you learn from these kids day in, day out. And they are real life lessons. Yeah, it's incredible how you say that. I have so many similar experiences. There's some kind of divine convergence that happens with darkness and light in these places where there's seemingly nothing of physical material means that you just can't put into words these kind of experiences that happen that surpass our human condition and are just so inspiring to keep us moving on. There was a situation where I was in Tanzania and we had the opportunity when I was with World Vision, we were drilling 10 wells in this community. And there's kind of a council that comes together to decide because we want the local community leaders to be able to tell us what's best, not coming from the outside. And of course, all of our staff there are national, they're locals, they understand the realities on the ground. But I was visiting a hospital and I saw one of the water points that was right in the hospital, which was critical. But when I asked the national director, why was this water point put here? Because most of the time people want them in their own neighborhoods as close to their families or their kids or schools. And they said, yeah, absolutely. The committee met and they all decided unanimously that they wanted this water point, which was fairly remote for most of them in where the hospital was because they knew that the hospital often faced shortages of water. And you can imagine what that does to the sanitizing of medical instruments and how much water is needed for everything from surgery to childbirth. And that they all came together to put this water point far from us, but close to where those who will be most vulnerable could be us, but it could very well be others. Prioritize it to go there. I just think it was an example that it wasn't always me, myself and mine. It was what's the best for the most vulnerable in the community. Um, Even for people who were quite vulnerable themselves, they were prioritizing needs of those more vulnerable than them. Kind of flies in the face in many ways of how we live in uh, Western society. We can learn a lot from. Jamie, you've had a lot of experience in global humanitarian efforts. Would you care to share some stories along those lines? The reality is every single story that I have been sharing, every story that I would share, none of these are things that I have ever done. They're all things that either investigators who put themselves in harm's way to go undercover into some of the most dangerous places and doing it unarmed because they desperately care about the children who are being victimized or it's the local community who would have the opportunity to leave their place of residence in Haiti or Uganda, sometimes having been educated at a high degree in the West, returning or staying in their local community context because they want to provide a future for those around them and because they love their home. To see a pastor that I met in El Salvador in a season of incredible gang violence and then police reprisals that were often even more violent than what the gangs were doing. To see a pastor risk his own safety to take on the corrupt police who he witnessed shoot in cold blood in the back a 16-year-old boy who had been working in a bakery to try and get a fresh start away from the gangs that he was conscripted into early on, which you do for sheer survival. And this pastor saw this boy, you know, shot in the back by police and paramilitary gear. And the police officer putting his boot on the boy's throat as the boy was bleeding to death, not rendering aid, not calling the ambulance, but allowing this boy to bleed out. And the pastor, 10 feet away, just beside himself. 
watching what's happening with this man with an assault rifle, letting this boy die under the crush of his boot. When he denounced the police, he ended up getting brought to the police station. They um, took his watch, shattered it at the butt of their rifle. They stole his shoes. They intimidated him basically to say, if you want to tell anyone what happened, what happened to your watch is what could happen to you. Um, and to watch this man, I met this man again, like nine months later, who was still proceeding, uh, even though he had been brought into the jail and had been intimidated and had threats of violence visited upon him. Here he was sitting with his wife and their nine month old little baby. And I'm saying, how is it that you're like, you're crazy? How can you take this risk to take on this corrupt police officer when you've got a little baby and you live in that community and you know what can happen to you? And he said, you know, Jamie, this boy, his mom's a member of my church. He's part of my flock. He's like a sheep in my flock. How can I turn away? This is what Jesus calls me to do. That identification, you know, the good shepherd lays down their life for the sheep. It's pretty staggering to see. Or to meet with the warden of the prison where I met. Uh, we went to a men's and a woman's prison. They were filled with people who had been in gangs. Many of them uh, had been conscripted there. In the woman's prison, I met with these women who, if they get incarcerated and they have babies or they're pregnant, they will raise their babies until the age of five in their own prison cell. I saw these shopping bags suspended above their mattresses that I thought had their few belongings. And I saw some rustling and it was the cradle, the crib for the infants were suspended above their parents' bed. You know, and these women, you know, I was just sharing with them, trying to understand their stories. And the prison warden would tell me, many of these women, they are utterly innocent. They get things pinned on them or their boyfriends or husbands who have power over them will basically make them serve the sentence that they should have done. Mm -hmm. And the outside society just wants to throw a match on this place and burn it all down because of the level of gang violence. But if you look and meet with these women, and I did, to hear their stories and to see some of them working to provide a better way for their own kids. I don't even know how to articulate, but it is a reality that people encounter things that are behind the scenes that you may have no visibility into. And sometimes people make wrong choices and do horrendous things and need to be held to account but um, also need to be given an opportunity to get on the right path. And those walking with them and accompanying them and putting themselves in harm's way to try and fight for a better way and a better day, those are the heroes. Author Alexander Solzhenitsyn said many years ago, that it is time in the West to defend not so much human rights as human obligations. Let's turn our focus to some global humanitarian efforts, starting with the Horn of Africa. A humanitarian context, Somalia. I was on a trip to South Africa for some microcredit work and then was in Tanzania for some other work. I saw some ominous clouds that were gathering around food insecurity in this area in Somalia. And I started piecing together some of the media reports and some of the reports from our teams on the ground. What I started to realize stunned me that the area that was starting to face another round of droughts and possible starvation en masse had been an area that only six years earlier, the city of Baidoa, Somalia, had actually had the first modern day widespread famine declared since the Ethiopian famine of 1984. And 260 thousand people died in this area, the city of Baidoa, that was known as the city of death. 260,000 people died. And it wasn't even a blip on the international radar screen. Yeah. I was in this sort of field and I hadn't heard about it back when that had taken place. But they said things were getting worse to the point where in the whole East Africa region, the prospects of some 20 million people dying was not an unrealistic possibility. So we determined we needed to go in and at least find out what was happening and take some of these stories, if it was true, to the media outlets. And when I got there, I was blown away. We saw massive lineups of people with donkeys trying to line up for water, 
just unending lines and the dust that was there. I was in cholera treatment centers uh, that World Vision and Save the Children and the Canadian government had, you know, meeting with parents who had brought their children and lost seven of their kids along the way and only one of them survived, lost all of their livestock along the way. To see that, that people were dropping like flies and this famine was imminent. You know, we had the opportunity to kind of sound the alarm. Uh, our own organization pushed a couple million dollars that had been allocated to raise resources and market and share of what was going on and help more kids. Just pushed that money over into immediate emergency response and worked with other NGOs, worked with the Canadian government. We got to share with national media outlets here in Canada and they raised the alarm. And as we were leaving, the new Secretary General for the UN made it, the first international visit was to go into Baidoa to sound the alarm. Indeed, the alarm was sounded and people responded and organizations stood together and they were able to avert mass starvation. And it was, it was desperately close to a tipping point where it mm -hmm. could have gone the other way. And so to me, when you can avert disaster, and establish resilience so that people can have the tools and the means and the resources to farm and to irrigate and to do things that will prevent the next one. That to me is life transforming work and it restores your soul hmm. to know that there is some good in this world. I forget who said this, but there's some good in this world and it's worth fighting for. It might've been Tolkien through uh, the wool baggins that said <laughs> that, but uh, whatever the case, um, it is just that. We go through this world once. There are people around us who will touch and transform our lives through their courage, their tenacity, despite the adversity that they face, if we have the eyes to see. And if we listen to what Martin Luther King Jr. talked about, where he basically said, I can't capture it with the eloquence that he had, that we're all interwoven together in this garment of destiny. We need to understand that what affects one affects us all. He said injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Mm. And yet, if we free ourselves, he in another place said, basically from the narrowing individualist concerns of our own self to the broader concerns of all humanity, we get liberated from that self-imposed exile of me and mine and more into the we and us. We stand together if we truly love God then we better love our neighbor as ourselves. And who is the neighbor? Not someone who can repay us because we invite them to our celebration and they scratch our back by inviting us to their party. It's when the person who was beaten and left half dead by the Jericho Road was encountered by the unlikeliest of people who was from a different ethnicity, a different religion. They shouldn't even have been associating. And yet the Samaritan came near and cared and said, this could be me. I've got to do something for them not only showed up to stand with that person and save their life in that moment, but provided so that they could be restored to full health and looked after their well-being. That was the one who was proving that they were a neighbor who cared for, who genuinely had compassion, who legitimately loved their neighbor as their self. Those are the people that I need to learn from. And day in, day out, it's a constant fight against my own selfishness, fighting for my own needs to be able to say, no, no, no. What are the concerns that affect us all? And how can we stand shoulder to shoulder and fight for a better day? Wow. You had touched on Somalia there, working with some of the world's poorest nations. How do you reconcile the poverty that you've seen with a fairly common prevalent sense of ingratitude or entitlement in a country like Canada with so many material resources? I struggle with this myself. You know, we're away for a while and everything gets contextualized and put into perspective. We come back here and I have to bite my own proverbial lip for myself and for other situations that I see other people in. How do you work through that? How do you process that with all you've seen? Yeah, something that I have to do repeatedly and uh, more often confronting it again in myself because we're so accustomed to um, not even going to blame the ads or the marketing that entice us to buy more and to get more and to have this experience and that. You know, we do live in this sort of fairy tale existence, this, this Disneyland compared to many in the world. I know that there is hardship right here in Canada. I know that different people have different experiences here. But when you look around the world, the level of inequity, inequality, injustice, it's quite staggering. 
and then the resources allocated to address it or fight it are minuscule compared to the scale and the scope of the need. Mm -hmm. But here in Canada, I think sometimes we get into smug self-assurance like, well, you know, they didn't look after themselves. They didn't do X or Y. That country, well, there's corruption there. So, well, okay, yeah, there may be corruption there, but that kid on the street didn't cause the police officer to be corrupt. That girl who's trafficked in our brothel didn't cause that, you know, German tourist to go over there and rape them. That mother who's trying to raise her four children as a pastoralist, a nomad in rural Kenya or Somalia, has no dog in the fight of the different warring groups that are fighting for resources or oil or the geopolitical things that, that are at play that so many countries are complicit in. It's about recognizing that, you know what, I have no idea what led someone to the circumstance and the situation that they're in, but I can't take credit for the circumstance and situation I find myself in. Did I apply myself? Did I do X or Y? Okay, sure. But did I work harder than the mom who is working, trying to nurse her baby while she's crushing rocks under the blazing South Asian sun? Um, no, I can guarantee you she'll work harder in a week than I will in my lifetime. You know, Mother Teresa said it well, there's enough resources in the world to meet everyone's need, but not enough to meet everyone's greed. And I think that's the battle, right? Mm -hmm. It's, am I going to allow my apathy and complacency? Because it's hard to care about anything beyond myself. It's easy to care about myself and to whine about my needs. You know, a hangnail for me is like a traumatic experience. <laughs> but if a child steps on a landmine in Cambodia, a landmine that was there, or Vietnam, that was there some 30, 40 years ago, does it really affect me? Of course it would if we were there, we're parents, we're humans. We, Of course it would, it would rock our world and we would do whatever we could to help. But when it's out of sight, out of mind, or when there's risk involved, or when we get so surrounded by the needs closer to home and trying to meet our mortgage payment, and maybe you find yourself between jobs, like these are real struggles. I don't want to minimize. But the order of magnitude of what others are going through and the ability for us to do something about it, just at least by making space in our heart to care enough, to care enough to maybe lift up our voice, to advocate for them, to share a story, to sponsor a child, to help one kid, you know, get an education, to making different choices about what we might do as consumers or to take our businesses that maybe are going through a period of some profitability and say, I want to put a bit of this in or to take some of our church budget and say, hey, you know what? We could repave, you know, our parking lot and there's a need for that. But what if we pushed it off for just another season and took a bit of money to help people who are struggling because COVID is running rampant in some of these contexts in Peru, they don't have food on the tables. They've got to put themselves in harm's way to go and work. They've got to put themselves in harm's way to go in the market and sell their wares so they can feed their children tonight and clothe them tomorrow. And if we could stand with them, maybe they'd make it through this storm and probably find more resources to be able to move forward in our own area as well. Jamie, you've had quite a wide breadth of experience in working with different organizations, and you currently are the executive director of Partner Relations for Compassion Canada, a very widely respected humanitarian organization. Are you able to share some of the work that Compassion Canada is currently focused on and some of the greatest needs they have and the regions that Compassion is focusing on right now? as we're recording this in November of 2020. Yeah, so it's really a while for me to be back with Compassion, having you know had the privilege of early on in my journey um, when I returned to Canada from pastoring in California, got the chance to spend about four years with Compassion for Allison Alley, our new CEO, to uh, say, hey, Macintosh, we could use you on our team to help enlist Canadians in helping kids overseas. Compassion's model is distinctive. I've always respected the organization since really I was a teenager and was exposed to some of the work. Uh, I remember pitching for a well project uh, that was happening in Africa and I remember 
the government was putting in three dollars for every dollar that a Canadian would put in. And so I remember as a teenager, I don't know, I was maybe like 15 or something. Through my summer job working on a strawberry farm, I was able to pull together about 250 bucks. And that was going to be a thousand bucks to help put in a well for some kids overseas. A thousand bucks, I don't know. That was huge in my mind. And it wasn't me. It was, you know, multiplied generosity, right? Well, coming back into this organization now, which back then was in Canada, we were approaching our, I think it was 20,000 children being sponsored by Canadians. Now it's currently well over 100,000 actively being helped and how many hundreds of thousands over the years and globally over 2.1 million children. And it's through holistic child development model. We're church-based, we're Christ-centered, more child-focused. So we just realized that Jesus always loved the little children. Uh, he always blessed them. He always made them a priority. And we want to do the same. The church is everywhere. There's children in need. And if we can walk with the local church who wants to so prioritize children, I stand with them. You know, we have over 8,000 churches, you know, in Latin America, Africa, South, Southeast Asia, who are helping children get an education, hear about God's love for them, that he has a hope and a future to see them use their gifts in full flourishing and full dignity. Now in the season of COVID, we're in a situation like many other places in most of the country contexts, you know, schools are not operational because of the need for social distancing. And so our teams are figuring out ways to get out into the community and do water, sanitation, and hygiene, train children and their families in the sanitation in through appropriate you know masking and appropriate social distancing providing emergency food kits to families you know and doing that millions upon millions of these we've sort of shifted and some people will be like well are you deviating from your child development work to do this emergency response or community development i mean if your own kids that you're pouring into you might have your child at school but they fall off the monkey bars and break their arm you know well you're going to pull them out of school and get them to the hospital and then you're going to care for them in that way and if there's a threat to their health if there's a threat to their safety whatever that danger is that's where you rally around to protect yeah. them yeah. we want to ensure that kids are known loved and protected and so you rally around that way get them through this season so they survive and then long term work on all of the things it's going to take to see them flourish and that's working with them directly working on helping them with education literacy character traits to to entrepreneurial skills as they get older so they're able to not only fend for themselves but provide for their families their communities leadership development and yet this happens in the network of relationships with the local healthcare system and ensuring that they're able to advocate for just laws to make sure that children aren't preyed upon and so it's this really holistic form of child development that our partners in the local church are three steps in front of us in seeing what the needs on the ground are, anticipating them, responding to them, because they know these kids by name. They know their backstories. They know their families. They know the gauntlet that they have to run in life. And they would lay their lives down in a heartbeat to bend for these kids. So they're coming up with innovative ways to ensure that kids are known, loved, and protected. And so right now, we need Canadians to stand with us. We have been running a campaign called We Rise as One. We just passed one and a half million dollars raised to help children through this emergency season of COVID. But one of the biggest needs right now is globally, there's over a quarter of a million children that Compassion had committed to supporting, to educating, to helping flourish, that we anticipated we would find Canadians and Americans and Brits and others to sponsor them. But with the advent of COVID, we anticipate that there's over a quarter of a million children that we will not be able to find sponsors for. Oh. And so we need Canadians to step up and to say, $39 a month, can I help one child, maybe two? Can I put some money into the general fund to help stand in the gap, to help children who maybe their sponsor in Canada lost their job and is not able to carry on? Can I step up and chip something in? It can sound crash that the biggest thing we need is, is cash, but the reality is we've got experts on the ground People who know these children, who know their language, who know their culture, who know their situation, who've lived it themselves, who are walking with them and accompanying them on this journey. And we need those who will give of what they've gathered to help them make it through. And then we can watch as these kids rise up 
and become leaders in their own communities, in their own countries. Some of them rise to become national leaders. Some of them become physicians and nurses who are on the front lines. Many of those who are leading these efforts went through our programs earlier. Many in Korea, Korea is sponsoring so many children around the world, supporting so many of these interventions. When Korea was the first country that we started mm -hmm. um, helping children in need when the Korean War was leaving so many orphaned and vulnerable. Now to see that Korea is one of the strongest countries pouring in and reaching other children, it shows you it, it goes around and we all need each other. That's true transformation right there. Wow. Isn't it? Yeah. It, it really is. Thanks for sharing that, Jamie. And if you want to find out more work on Compassion Canada, you can go to compassion.ca. And there's information there on child sponsorship and ways to support the incredible work that Compassion Canada is doing around the world. Jamie, do you have any final words that you'd like to share on this current epoch of time that we're living in and making the world a better place? It can be easy. You framed your whole podcast, I love it, around the 6-8 culture. You know, what is required of you, O mortal, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And I think the reality is, I'm just stumbling through this. Yeah, I have a passion for justice, but it's a fight to try and do the right thing. And I'm not holier than thou. I'm still figuring all this stuff out. To love mercy, you know, when someone comes to me off on the highway, uh, <laughs> I want to act in a different way than merciful and humility. Like, I'd love to say I wrote the book on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> humility, that's one of the most elusive things. Sure. Um, and we certainly don't celebrate a prize in our culture. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed for unity, that they might be one like I and the Father are one. And I think in this moment, this cultural moment, this hyper-politicized, polemic moment mm. of division and derision, it's easy for us to locate on one or two or three issues of core concern to us and then be co-opted by one or other movement or political brand or what have you that would then want to force it to become our idol. And we turn off our critical thinking faculties and we demonize those who are of a different stripe. And I think that we certainly want to contend for the truth, but we need the humility to say we know in part <laughs> but we're still seeing through a glass darkly. Mm -hmm. We still don't get it all. And maybe there's something I could learn from someone who's sitting across the aisle, someone who's walked a different path. I think that there are important issues and concerns that are being raised by different groups, different political parties, different leaders. No one's got the corner on the market. I think we need the humility of Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. He basically wasn't arrogating to himself, you know, wasn't saying, oh, we're on the Lord's side. He was, with all humility, agonizing for the strife that was causing the body count to rise of, you know, Americans yeah. who were fighting one another over a critical need. I mean, slavery was massive. There were other issues rippling throughout. Instead, he was imploring that they would have charity towards all malice toward none, and that they would really find themselves to be in all humility, seeking to understand what was good and to follow that and to do it not in this sort of, I've arrived and mm -hmm. I've got the seal of heaven on everything I'm doing, but more of this lowering ourselves to say, I don't know, I don't have it figured out, but this piece, is this honoring of my neighbor? Is this ringed not only with justice, but with kindness? Is there compassion? Is there mercy? Is there humility in what I'm doing? How I'm doing it? In the Bible, there's so many places where it talks about loving kindness, which is also translated mercy. Yeah. That God acts towards us, even when we're caught up in all of our messes and doing it all wrong. Even when he laments, even when he sends the prophets to excoriate them for the injustices that they're visiting upon their brothers and sisters. There's always this imploring, there's always this pleading, if you would turn to me, if you would do right, if you would care for those around you, like I care for you. And there's this loving kindness which speaks of God's condescending, which sounds condescending, <laughs> but God, the almighty creator of us all, bowing down, inclining himself to serve us. Jesus, you know, who says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And then he bows down and takes the basin of water and the towel like a slave, 
makes himself the lowest of the low, washes the feet of those around him, and does it with love, even seeing Judas, who he knew was going to betray him, just continuing to pour out his love and pour out his life. I think we need more of that. We need more of those who, like Archbishop Oscar Romero, who saw the strife that was going on in San Salvador, and he spoke against the violence and the greed, and he called attention to the violence of the government and the violence of the rebels um, or the guerrillas and called them to remember that they were brothers and sisters and that they needed to love one another. And he also called out people's, not just the social evil, but the personal sin and called people to say, it all starts in our own hearts and we need the love of Christ to enter our hearts, to love one another. And then we can walk together. But him standing up against those forces of evil and speaking out against them, just calling for the violent revolution of love. That's it. Not violence mm-hmm. of arms, but of love. He actually was gunned down while he was offering communion to his parishioners. And I've been to the small chapel in San Salvador. He was gunned down while breaking the bread and pouring out the wine. Are we living lives that are offering the love of Christ, the mercy of Christ, and fighting with all humility and passion for the rights of our brothers and our sisters, for the dignity of the least of these, for those forgotten ones, those that the world considers the least of these. If we're offering it out in that way, then maybe like Amy Wilson Carmichael, who wrote the poem, Hast Thou No Scar? in which she basically tells this tale of her getting self-inflated and her importance that she was such this wonderful missionary doing these good deeds. And she was. She was actually working with girls who had been enslaved and trying to walk with them in freedom and care for them. But Jesus kind of said, don't get too high on your horse. Don't get too high and mighty, in effect. Can I see your scars? And I hear them hail your bright ascendant star, but hast thou no scar? He says, if you have no scar on hand or foot or side, you know, then are you really following me? Because pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Hast thou no wound, no scar? I think we want to trumpet the good things that we do. But I think by the brokenness, after Jesus was resurrected, he still had the scars of his love that he was able to offer to say, no, 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 I, I do love you. You're engraved on the palms of my hands. When our life is done, will we look like Jesus not by the things that we do or don't do, but will our lives and even maybe our bodies be marked with having walked alongside those who are suffering, accompanying those who are maybe going through a difficult journey of health or struggle with mental health or addiction? Like the greatest doctors amongst us who take all precautions, but they end up maybe succumbing to the illness that they're there treating. You know, I love how Mother Teresa didn't flee from the lepers, but said, bring them to me. And she washed them and bathed them. And maybe in so doing, she presented a radiant image of Christ who loves all, serves all, not in a way that says, I'm greater than you, but I am the servant of all. You are all my children that I love and want to embrace. As you've seen me love others, would you go out and do likewise? And so in our own bumbling way, maybe we can try and outserve each other rather than outshout each other. Maybe we can try and tend to the needs and the wounds of this world. Walter Storff said that the injustices of this world are the wounds of God. Can we bind up the brokenhearted and in so doing see the captive set free including ourselves, who are so often incaptivated to our own lives of narrow self-interest. I hope that we can. I believe that we will. And when I see people around the world who are doing just that, putting others better than themselves, fighting for the needs of the vulnerable, prioritizing their needs, making sure that they can eat first, making sure that they get a cup of cold water. When we do that, and when they see our love for one another, maybe they'll tune into the frequency to say, who, who is this Jesus that you speak of? Words of wisdom from humanitarian advocate Jamie McIntosh. Maybe we can outserve each other rather than outshout each other. Jamie, thank you so much for sharing some of your life experience 
some of the passion that you have had in trying to level the playing field here and just reaching out in love and the well that you drink from. It's really been a pleasure to listen to this and have you share this voice with so many. Again, if you want to find out more about the work that Jamie's currently involved with, you can visit the website compassion.ca. Thanks very much for joining us, Jamie. Thanks, Rob. And to your listeners, look, I don't know where you find yourself in the journey. I don't know what you're going through. God is pulling for you. And reach out to others if you're in need. There are people out there who want to fight with you to help pull through. And if you're in a position where you're able to reach your hand out to help someone else out, go after it with all you got, because we all need each other. God bless you as you do. Thanks for sharing your time with the 6-8 Culture Podcast, where we share stories of personal transformation that are making our world a more just, kind, and humble place. Join us for our next session of Impacting Stories with 6-8 Culture. This is Rob McKinley signing out with a reminder for us all to act justly, to be kind, and to walk humbly.